All right, can you guys hear me okay? Uh -huh. Yeah. Outstanding. Let me see here. So I have completely moved out of the kitchen now. So I, I'm in an office. There's a door. There's windows. There's two camera angles. There's a whiteboard. It's sometime in the future. There's going to be a, uh, a bookshelf that you can see behind me with, with books that make it look like I'm smart on the bookshelf. So I, I feel like I've, I've fully moved in. Incredible. Any, anybody else have anything exciting to share about this week? MQP papers are due. Let's yep. go. My MQP is trying to license to a company this Friday. That's really cool. I, I advised an MQP that managed to do that. That was that was a pretty cool thing. Um, what what did you guys make for your MQP? We designed a new knee brace. A new knee brace. Not not a brace for new knees, like for little babies, but a new design for for regular old people knees. Yeah, it's designed to lift the patella. Okay, that was that was totally one of those jokes that you guys were supposed to laugh at. Ha 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 ha! All right. Oh, <laughs> All right. my mic was muted. Sorry. Oh, oh okay. I I will assume that everybody was just laughing and their mic was muted. Oh wait. Oh yeah, that'll totally make me feel better. I'll I'll try to get a laugh track on one of these computers so I can press a button and it'll just sound like people are laughing. Maybe we'll have you guys record that for me one of these days. Uh, uh, somebody brought their dog to class. Okay. Um, uh, let me let me turn the chat thing on so I can see what people are saying. Uh, chat. Okay, I think we're, I think we're all live. All right. Good morning. All right, so um, I get the participants view open. And so how many of you watched the video that I posted to watch for Wednesday? Say yes in the participant thing. Five. Oh, somebody said no. Fourteen. I once asked in, uh, in a lecture, I said, uh, how many of you watched the uh or sorry i said how many of you did the reading that i uh that i posted to read before coming today's lecture and two people out of the 50 or so people that were in the room raised their hand nobody was even embarrassed not to raise their hand which i, I thought was and then i said how many of you knew that there was a reading assigned for today's lecture and almost all the hands went up and then I said, how many of you knew that the reading was a 45 second long YouTube video? And, and even most of the hands stayed up, but nobody was embarrassed to have not even watched it before coming to the class. It was something I wanted people to have seen before the class started. So, uh, so I get about, I don't know, a little bit less than half of you watched the video. Somebody that, somebody that watched the video, um, Oh, I see some yeses going away when I say that, so they don't get called on. Look at that. The number's going down. <laughs> um, John Riley, you said you watched the video, and you didn't delete your yes when I started talking. Um, what was your impression? What did you get out of it? Um, I, I, I honestly was a little confused at first on exactly what was going on, but I gathered that it was about the importance of tolerances and how the, the tool can art and how to take that into account when designing. Okay. 
Uh, Matthew Copeland, what did you think? I thought it was very informative. Uh, the part that kind of stuck with me was how when when tolerancing is taken into effect, there'll be uh, a few letters to the side of it specifying which method to use for the tolerancing. Yeah, that, that can be very important depending on um, on which parameter it is too that you're, you're putting the tolerance on. So um, in the in so we, we talked a little bit about surface roughness earlier, like measurement of surfaces, surface pathology. And um, and I mentioned that well, we talked about a couple of different parameters. We talked about the average roughness, that that average distance of all the points from the mean line is sort of the most common way people use to um, to specify roughness in the US and that the RMS roughness or basically the, uh, the um, standard deviation is the way that a lot of other people will specify roughness, the, uh, the RQ. Um, but if you change the way you separate roughness from waviness by changing the parameters for the filter you use, it changes the answer that you get. And so I, I worked. Uh, I worked and have done a lot of consulting in that area of surface metrology and, and stuff. And if the designer doesn't specify how to make the measurement and how to do that at uh, filtering, then the metrologist can get any answer that they want. So I can always prove that my part met your specification if you don't tell me how to do the measurement. So there's more information than just what's the dimension and what's the tolerance. Um, and, and I think in the video, he also talked about the, the standards, right? And, and there's different ways to report this on the drawings. And, uh, and so somebody that took ES 1310, when you guys talked about tolerances and, and things like that, what was, what was the primary focus was how to correctly put it on the drawing. Is that correct? Yeah, it was more like how to label it. Right. And did, and I, it's, you know, I said, uh, I took the class a long time ago. Did they spend much time talking about how to select the correct tolerance? What do you mean by select the correct so, tolerance? So we talk in, 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 the, uh, in the design class, or ES 1310, we talk about how to, to put the dollars on the drawing so that the manufacturer knows what you meant. Did they tell you how to select the number that goes on the drawing where the tolerance is? I'm going to say no, because I'm not quite sure what you're talking about. OK, uh, so it was when we uh, when we were talking last time. Um, let's see. All right. I'm going to switch cameras. And you guys see the camera, right? I'm not sharing the screen now. I'm going to go with yes. Nobody said no. Okay. Um, Correct. Uh, you know what? I didn't move in here. Oh, no, there it is. I found my eraser. I thought I forgot to move the eraser. Okay. So we were looking at the Y block when we... Uh, when we talked last time, and we were talking about the fact that the distance between the two holes here has to be the same as the distance between the two holes on the clamp that we're buying, right? And that uh, we can have some uncertainty. So if I've got my two holes here, Right, so there's my uh, my two holes for my Y block, and we've got a distance between them. So, and that's the nominal distance, and we've got our clamp, which is a physical part. And I'm not. Again, you can see. You can see that I became an engineer not because I'm really good at art. So, um, and also, I'm an engineer. I'm not a CAD technician or a drafts person. 
So I don't always know the right way to follow all the standards to put the dimensions on there. Um, and, and that's sort of that's something that um, I, maybe I probably knew it when I was taking the quizzes for ES1310. And I don't remember it now. Has anybody ever experienced that before? Where you, uh, where you learned something to pass the test and then you forgot it again later? Anyone? Of course. Of course, all right. We, we, all, we all do that. Um, was there any value in having learned it? Sometimes, God, no. All right, so I heard sometimes and God, no. Um, the, the person- No, I said that, if you've forgotten it, not God, no. <laughs> oh, what, what did you say? If you have forgotten it, then no. If you have forgotten it, then no. So <clears throat> I, I think that even if you forget it after the quiz, I think that there is still some value because it'll come back to you more quickly at the moment when you need to relearn it. Um, and I think, well, why did you want to do it for the quiz? Why did you bother to learn it for the quiz? You get a good grade on the quiz? You got a grade on the quiz. And so there's some value to the grade, right? Yeah, we'll just say that there's some value to the grade. So there, there can be some value. Um, so when I was working as an engineer, I never had to prepare drawings that were going out. Um, I was always able to make sketches and then some drafts person or a CAD technician would take my sketches, make it into the official drawing. So I, I was lucky I never had to do that, which is why after having learned it for ES1310, I forgot. But if this is our clamp, so my sketch of the clamp here, our sort of top-down view, and I don't know, there's a right. So that's the part that's the part that goes up and around on the clamp. And so we've got these holes here, right? And we've got our fastener. So we draw the fastener. Right, and our fastener's got threads on it. And so we call this a clearance hole. And so this is a threaded hole, it's a tapped hole. Right. And so what we what we were saying was that if if so this hole, can it be smaller than this diameter? A clearance hole? Oh. Right, so, well, what happens if it's smaller? The screw won't fit. So we'll call this D sub S. So, but what happens if the screw doesn't fit? Well, my kind of thread itself, sort of, sometimes that works. Like if it's not too much um, bigger, then it could just kind of like figure what do, we, what, do we do, what do we do if the screw doesn't fit in the hole? Drill out the hole to make it bigger. Yeah, yeah, I had an MPP group that used to call that wallering out the hole. And they would take their drill and they would put it in the hole. Let's see, do I have anything? No, if I try to do this, it'll be dangerous. But they would take their drill, they would put it in the hole, they'd pull the trigger <laughs> on the drill, and then they would do this with the drill. Anybody ever done that? Mm -hmm. That's a classic. Yeah, yeah, yeah this MPP group. Uh, I think the kids in the MQP group that coined the phrase, I think, I think he was from Tennessee. And he said, yeah, we're gonna wall her out those holes so that we can put that together. Um, when I was uh, working, so I worked summer jobs in uh, when I was in college and I, I worked as a millwright's apprentice. I actually worked myself up to be a journeyman millwright. And we didn't call it wallering out the hole. Um, and, and we used slightly more sophisticated tools but basically when in, in this the situation when you can't get the uh, get the screw in because the holes don't quite line up is different from the situation uh, when you can't get the screw in because the holes too small right so we put these if we put these holes too close together but this hole is bigger than the fastener. This hole is the tapped hole for the fastener. We can put this fastener in, right? And then when we go to put this fastener in, 
the holes don't line up. Has anybody ever experienced that? Yes. And so that's the second situation where you want to waller out the hole. Is that true? Does it ever work well, by the way? Doing the drill thing and moving it around like that. Does it ever actually work well? No. Depends on how much finesse you have. Yeah, so one of the problems with doing that is you tend to pivot around the center of the hole. So you might make both edges of the hole bigger, but the center stays the same diameter roughly. Um, the other thing is the drills aren't actually intended to cut in that direction. So it, it tends to make it tough that way. Um, the better technique rather than wallering out the hole is to, uh, is to get a bigger drill bit and just make the hole bigger with the same center point. It's kind of convenient that I'm still constructing my bookcase here, so I have all these hand tools to play with in class. Um, okay, so we've all experienced that. So if we wanted to know what the tolerance here needs to be, what did we have to consider again? So this distance, If we want to know what that distance should be in plus or minus, what do we need to consider? How much bigger the holes on the fastener on the brace are than the than DS. We need to know the actual size of these holes. Right? And we need to know how much bigger are they or the allowance between this hole and the fastener diameter. Right? So we need to know how much bigger the holes are. And we also need to know the, the uncertainty of this distance, right? Because all manufactured goods have some uncertainty. So we need to know the uncertainty of the distance here and the size of these holes. And of course, the uncertainty in the size of the holes is also gonna be important. Um, so we need to know those different things. If we know that, we can determine functionally what this has to be. All right, so let's get back to the... Uh, let's get back to the point of one hole. So we'll draw a part here. We've got one hole in the part and we've got one fastener and let's say that this fastener let's just say that this is a pin that's going in here all right and we've got a hole here let's draw a better picture of my part Now I'm trying to be an artist. It's gonna backfire. Okay, so I wanna put the pin in the hole. How do I know how big to make the hole? How do I know how big to make the hole? measurement perhaps like of the bolt all right so i need to know the dimensions of the pin you guys you guys got dowel pins in your uh, in your kits right yeah yeah did uh, did you guys measure the dowel pins did we have you measure those uh no i couldn't figure out what it was for uh, it was for measuring in case we wanted to have something for you guys to measure it's so the nice thing about those dowel pins is they're they're ground with a very high level of precision on that diameter. And so, well, with your calipers for sure, if you had a hundred of those dowel pins, if you measured all hundred of them, you'd get the same measurement for each one. You wouldn't be able to measure the variation, well, unless you screwed up. 
but uh, you wouldn't be able to, with that caliper, measure the variation in the, the diameters there. So that's that's very nice. They're very very precise. And there's a little, there's very little uncertainty in the diameter of those pins. Um, I think. I don't remember what sizes we gave you. I think we gave you six and eight millimeter pins, depending on which kit you had. Because uh, we ran out of one size and switched to the other. All right. So let's just say that this is one inch diameter. There's one inch diameter. How big does the hole need to be? So if the uh, if the pin is a one inch diameter, it, we could say it's it's one inch. All right, it's plus or minus point oh 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 two inches. We have a supplier of pins, and they guarantee that they won't give us any pins that are bigger than one point oh 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 two or any pins that are smaller than 0.9998. Right. So all of the pins are in this size range that we have. How big does the hole need to be? 1.0002. So if the hole is 1.0002, can you put the pin in the hole? Every time. Technically, you should be able to. As, as long as as long as we assume we have no uncertainty of measurement, right? So if, if we don't actually know how big the, the hole is or the, the pin is, then then it makes this sort of a um, moot conversation. But if we assume we have no uncertainty of measurement, now what if the hole is point nine nine eight nine. What if so if we make a part and that's the hole diameter? Can we put the pin in the hole? Depends how much force are you using. Right, we can totally put this, we can totally put the pin in this hole if we push hard enough, right? And, and when you have trouble putting the pin in the hole, what do you do? This Try is an solution. It. Say it again? Try to force it. Oh, I was gonna say get a bigger hammer. Um, but uh, but yeah, so there's times when you want to have that interference. We call that an interference fit. Or a force fit. Or a press fit. What are interference, force fits, press fits good for? Door hinges. Not if you want to open and close the door. I mean, like actually making the door hinge when they're put together. They tend to not be interference fits on purpose on door hinges. I think they tend to be locating fits or close sliding fits. When when do you when do you actually want a press fit like this? When you want it to not move. When you want the thing to not move, when you want it to not come apart again later. And so it's it's a great assembly method for things that you don't expect to have to take apart again. So if you're only gonna put it together and you're never gonna take it apart again, you'd love to have a force fit. In fact, you could calculate how much force it takes to push this pin in this hole. What would you need to know to calculate how much force it takes? You guys are engineers. We could look it up in the in the machinery handbook. You all right? So one answer to my question is you would need to know the page on the machinery handbook where the equation is. But assuming you wanted to write the page on the machinery handbook and you wanted to design the experiment that figured it out, what do you have to know 
in order to calculate this force. Because as engineers, I think we should be able to derive these equations even if we don't choose to because we're going to look them up. What are, what are, the, what are the factors? What are we going to consider if we're going to calculate that force? Material properties. So we need to know material properties. Any particular property that we've talked about in class already? The elastic modulus, maybe. We need to know the elastic modulus. Uh, what else would we need to know? Like it. You need to know this. You need to know this for both the pin and the the we'll call it the hole, right? Because they might not be the same material. So, what else might we need to know if we're going to calculate how much force it takes? Size. And the size of each one, right? And so if we know the size difference, now would you want to calculate these all day long? Sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. Could you please repeat what you said? Siri, would you want to calculate these all day long? Desires. Like, did she answer for us? Siri's a pretty bad magic eight ball. <laughs> so we probably wouldn't want to calculate these all day long. And so I already I already sort of gave away the answer. But if you wanted to go up, go and look up what these should be, where would you look? The machinist handbook. I would start with the machinery's handbook. And use my new workspace here. Did you notice how I uh, how I switched cameras there? I used the keyboard shortcut to switch cameras. You can see all of my cameras in a row now. That is the one that's built into the laptop. That's the one that's pointed at the whiteboard. That's the other one that's built into the laptop that's showing the really cool wallpaper in this room. And that's the one that I normally use that's pointed at me. And it moves. Cool. All right, so, but I didn't want Alt-N to switch cameras now. I wanted Alt-Tab to switch applications. And I will share. All right, now I think I'm sharing my screen. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, you guys think I'm sharing my screen too. All right. So GDT is geometric dimensioning and tolerancing about, I don't know, a half or a third of you or so watched that video. Um, the, the purpose of that video is he talks a lot about the different symbols and um and the different ways to represent stuff on the drawing and all of that and honestly that stuff is boring to me so i didn't want to learn it well enough that i could explain it to you guys well but i think you should know that it exists and i think you should know how to find a resource to learn about the parts of it that you need to know when you need to know it and so uh so i i, I searched and there's there's um quite a few uh there's quite a few different um resources to talk about gd and t you can get a, a professional you can actually get a professional education certificate in gd and t at wpi if wpi ever reopens uh, no i am i bet you they offer that online too uh but the professional education people at wpi teach classes on gd and t it, it's really focused on how do you represent stuff on the drawing correctly so that the manufacturer without any ambiguity knows what it is that you mean. And, and why do we care about that as we do this GDNT stuff? Why do we care about representing it correctly? Maybe we don't. 
Why should you care about it if you don't now? So that if you pass it off to someone to manufacture, it gets manufactured correctly with whatever specifications you planned on having? Yeah, so what's what's the risk of passing it off to a manufacturer without having represented your dimensions correctly or your tolerances correctly? What's the what's the risk? They use dimensions or tolerances that don't that won't work for whatever application. So, yeah, the risk is that they misinterpret what your intent was and that they make something that meets their interpretation of your intent and that they ship it to you. And if you didn't represent your intent correctly, the risk is that you have to pay for it even if it doesn't work. And so customers don't like to pay for stuff that doesn't work in my experience. Customers like to send back stuff that doesn't work or they like to back charge you for stuff that doesn't work. They don't like to pay for it. And so the reason we want to represent our stuff correctly is so that if we ever get into a dis well, one, we don't want to get anything that doesn't work. But also if we ever get into a dispute about, um, if you ever get into a dispute between the customer and the manufacturer, it's easy to settle because it's clear on the, uh, it's clear on the drawing what the intent was. And, uh, and so there's a couple of different standards that we use to define how we're going to do this. Uh, you guys remember in your, uh, if you take, took ES1310, you remember at the bottom, there's that little block of text that goes on all the drawings. And one of the little places in there tells what standard are you referring to with the dimensions and the tolerances that are in this drawing. Um, there's the US standard uh, uh, put out by uh, ASME and ANSI. It's, it's the Y14 geometric dimensioning and tolerancing standard. The ISO, the International Standards Organization, in their ISO 213, they call it the geomet or sorry, the uh, the dimensioning and geometric product specifications or the GPS and the verification. And it was amazing to me when they renamed the standard to be the GPS standard because it was after everybody had a GPS in their phone and in their car. And they didn't realize that people were going to be confused by that. But it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. I've been to several, uh, I'm on a couple of uh, US standards committees, the ASME and ANSI committees. And I've been to several of these uh, ISO standards committee meetings. And it is, it's actually pretty amazing because you get a room full of really smart people who have volunteered their time to be at this meeting, but they don't all have the same um, same uh, mother tongue, so they don't all speak the same language. Um, I was in a meeting once where there was a, a French guy giving a presentation in English, talking about some work that he'd been doing. And, and as we gave him feedback, he was writing notes on his PowerPoint slides in French. And there was a German guy in the back of the room that was correcting his French grammar on the notes that he was writing to himself for when he got back. Um, so you can imagine that the kind of people that get in there uh, take several years to create one of these standards or to change one. Um, and so that's, that's kind of interesting too. But um, you specify the year of your standard, the, the particular standard that you're using, and then it sort of forms a contract between you and the manufacturer. If they don't measure it or per the standard requirements, and it doesn't work and you do measure it for the requirements and you can do back charging and stuff like that. Um, yesterday we had the Y block up here. We were talking about this, oops. And we're talking about tolerances. And so to tolerate is to allow something. We, I think we all understand what tolerances are in manufacturing, but it's, it's how much the designer is willing to let the, um, the manufacturer screw up. Now, the, uh, the definition of this is the, uh, so the tolerance as defined in, I think this is cut from the ISO standard, um, although I probably pulled it out of the machinery handbook. So it's the allowable deviation from a standard, especially the range of variation permitted in maintaining specific dimensions of a machine piece. 
Could it get more um, informative than that wording to that definition? Uh, anyway, so we look at it there. So that's the tolerance. Yeah, I think there's a video link here. Oh yeah, this is a good video. If we're going for a clean way, it's always another way. Try that on for size. Wow, look at that. So again, that's what you do if you uh, if the part doesn't fit, you can get a bigger hammer. Uh, how does the color? Yeah, so the correct tolerance is. So let's go ahead and I, this link works in my slides because I was already logged into the library's website and I already opened up the file. This is a link that goes to the 28th edition of the Machinery's Handbook. But if you're looking at any edition of the Machinery's Handbook from 25 on up, none of this stuff has changed. Probably even older than that. Uh, what we want to do is we want to look at Pretty good. I scrolled too fast. Dimension engaging and measuring. Let's see if I can zoom in. Oh, I can zoom in. Check it out. And so you can learn about the ANSI and the ISO drafting practices. That's a lot of what that video yesterday was talking about, those kind of things. Um, we can learn about how to make lines and how to do those things. That's not that interesting to me. Um, but basic sizes, tolerances, force fits, expansion and shrinkage fits. So you guys know that um, that uh, metals, especially, they, they get bigger when they get hot and they get colder when they get small. They get colder when they get smaller. They get smaller when they get cold. Um, so, if, so if you take the if you take that piece and you cool it down, it gets smaller. If you take the matey piece and you heat it up, it gets bigger. So you could take the part that has the hole in it and you could put it in the oven while you take the pin and you could put it in the freezer. And then you could quickly drop the pin into the hole. And then when everything gets to the same temperature, the pin expands, the hole shrinks, and you have a, uh, a temperature or a shrinkage fit. They actually, um, so they, they do that for holding tools in tool holders and CNC machines, where they use a uh, they use an inductive heater where they heat up the uh, the tool holder, they drop the tool in, and then they cool the tool holder, and it's held in place. Uh, but you can calculate different temperatures that you need. There's constants that you can look up depending on the materials that you're using. So that's kind of a cool thing. Let me go, let me go back. Does it go back to the table of contents? Oh, look at that, it does, but further back than I wanted to. And it doesn't remember that I zoomed in. All right, so allowances for tolerances and fits here. So we get basic sizes. Um, there's a bunch of different standard limits here and clearance for locational fits, running sliding fits. And this is a lot of what we do in, um, in our designs, in, especially in MQPs, is we're looking at doing these running and sliding fits, clearance and locational fits. So this is look at how they represent that here. So you've got tables. If I scroll through here, either before or after that table, there's, there it is. So it's visually represented right here. And then there's tables that you can go up and look up exact numbers down here. But let's look at this one here. All right, so a running or a sliding fit. Well, you guys you guys intuitively you know what this means, right? This is what it's it's similar to our um, so we've got our cylinder and piston here. So this is a sliding fit. So it, it's in there, it fits in there, but it's allowed to move back and forth. 
And so to do that, so the uh, so the cylinder, the ID of the cylinder represents the hole. The OD of the piston represents the shaft. The cylinder has to be bigger than the piston, right? If if the cylinder is the same size as the piston, well, here for any of these running and sliding pits, even this RC one, so that's the tightest tolerance. You see, there's a gap between the black and the and the filled line. The hole the hole and the hole tolerance has to be bigger, and the shaft and the shaft tolerance has to be smaller. And so, if we've got a clearance or a locational fit they can start to get overlapping. So this is where the um, where you're actually having to push it in. Um, then we've got um, these transitional fits where there's, there's clear overlap. And you can come down here and you can look up depending on, over here, depending on the size, the nominal size of the hole in inches. So if we're around one inch, we would look at this row right here. It'll tell us for those different classes of fits going across the table. No, I don't want to copy anything. I don't need the note. Come on. Okay. For the uh, for the different classes of fit, you can go across the table and you can see what the correct tolerances should be for both the shaft and for the hole. And so when you go to do your MQBs and you realize that two things have to line up and they have to slide together, rather than just winging it and saying, oh, well, this one needs to be, or even worse, just draw them both the same diameter and figure out when you go to manufacture it. Come to the machinery's handbook and look these things up so that you can accurately design your part so that no matter who makes the part, it will be, uh, it'll be correct. All right, so the machinery's handbook, you can look those things up. Back to the presentation slides. Um, and so there's running and sliding locational force fits. We talked about that. Here's a zoomed in version of that running and sliding graph. Um, now we know that we've done this. We know that we've got the right size part because we're gonna go ahead and measure the parts, right? You guys have got a chance to play with your calipers. Um, there's micrometers. And I think I gave an example of these when we did our measurement lecture where micrometer can measure the same kind of things calipers can, but uh, it'll be a more precise measurement um, we've talked about accuracy, and, and so accuracy is really is made up of these two different things. And there's trueness, it's how close to the true value are you, and there's precision, it's how close are your measurements to each other. And, and we, we talked about that before, in the fact that uh, having a, a very precise measurement tool isn't necessarily going to be a very true measurement tool. And so this, again, defined by the ISO. We go through there and slide that examples out. So when we've got our tolerance, we would and stop this page here. No, that wasn't the camera I wanted to end up on. That's the camera I wanted to end up on. It was two clicks, not three. Okay, so when we've, um, we've learned how to represent our tolerances on the drawing. So we know how to represent the tolerances on the drawing. If we're not sure, we can go look up in the standard how to represent something. Um, if we've got a drawing that somebody else gave to us and we don't understand what one of the symbols is, we can go look up what it means. Um, there's actually, you can look at it in the uh, machinery's handbook for some of those symbols through the whole section. Uh, but as you want to do that, or you can go directly to the standard. <clears throat> so we've, we've got our tolerance for our running and sliding bits. We can figure out how to functionally make, um, make our tolerances for the distance between holes. Uh, when you get the um, when you get the spacing of the holes incorrect, our tendency is to try to go make one of the holes bigger. Uh, but 
as, as you make the hole bigger, you run the risk of making it so big that the fastener doesn't uh, doesn't hit hit it very well. Um, when we're making parts, so now if we're the manufacturing engineer, and we're supposed to make, let's say, we're supposed to make this round part. Maybe it's the piston for our Sterling engine or our thermoacoustic engine. So it's got these little divots in it, right? I think there's two or three of these little divots. And um, all right, so we've got that. We've got this nominal diameter that we're trying to make. And we'll say it's plus or minus 0. 0.0006 inches for our nominal diameter there. And this is, by the way, this is 0.860. So I guess I'll put another O oh, since I get another dimension there. So when we're doing this, if we make a bunch of parts, so if we're manufacturing our parts, and we make a graph of the parts as they come off. So this is n, this is a number of parts. And maybe n in thousands. And this is D over here. And so here's our nominal. And we're going like this. And so maybe this is our tolerance here. So this is plus 0. 0.0006 and this is minus 0. 0.0006. So as we see the trend start to go up like that, what does it tell us? Tool is wearing out slightly. Tells us the tool's wearing out slightly. Okay, so let's assume that we don't see that trend. So we can con we can easily control for that trend, right? We can we can adjust the tool wear. We can change tools. There's lots of things we can do to adjust for that if we observe it. If we're making these parts, and we're making them here, if it starts to go up, we'll still see it. Should we make them that size? No. Or how about this size? Which is a better size? If we had to pick between red and blue, this is red. This is blue. If we had to pick between red and blue, which is a better size? Probably. Now they're both within the spec. So we could ship all those parts to our customer. What did you say? Somebody somebody had an answer? I just said probably red. Probably red. That's the one that's the smaller one. So I this think. is we're make yeah, that's the one that's the, on the minus side. So we're making the pistons. And so we're taking bigger stock and making it smaller. So if I had to choose between red and blue and I was the manufacturer, I would choose blue. And the reason I would choose blue is because if for some reason my measurement was wrong and it was really that was the tolerance down here, I could put these parts back in the machine and make them smaller. But if, if it was wrong on the other side and that was the tolerance, I could never put the red parts back in the machine to make them bigger. Um, so there's things that you want to consider as, as manufacturing if you're, if you're machining a part smaller, then you may want to shoot for the high end of the tolerance range, at least when you're setting up the machine, so you can always fix those parts that go out of tolerance. Uh, so just something to think about as we're doing that. Um, I think we're running out of time. Um, we got class again next week on Tuesday, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess I'll see you guys on Tuesday. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.
In the lab, there's an assignment. How oh, is he gone? 